let me start with a brief motivation and a high level overview of the features uh, of data led and the problems that it may solve. So uh, there are a number of problems that most of us have seen during their careers, basically regardless of which career stage we're in. Uh, one of them uh, can be summarized in this little study here. So you write a paper about an algorithm, um, you stay up late, you generate good looking figures, you do it in an interactive R session or MATLAB session or Python session or whatever. Um, you tweak a lot of parameters to make your algorithm work. Uh, a lot of the options, maybe a GUI is involved. And then at the end of the night, it works, it looks fantastic, it's great. But the next morning you wake up basically hung over and you have no idea what you actually did to produce those figures and which of the figures are actually the ones that needed to be reported in the manuscript. And you have to repeat the work of last night again. The next little story is your research project produces phenomenal results. You're at the end of your PhD, you're about to graduate, but your laptop, the one and only place that stores the source code for your results, the figures, everything, is either stolen or it just broke down as laptops do, as this really sad story of a fifth year chemistry graduate student who is desperate to buy back their laptop that was stolen just before they were to defend their PhD and was the only place that had the presentation on it. A different question, um, maybe mostly for the PIs, and supervisors included in the audience uh, is this one here. The graduate student approaches the supervisor. They complain that the research idea just does not work. It's completely useless. There are weeks of discussions proceeding uh, and it basically becomes apparent that the oral communication between the two, maybe also the virtual, um, it really doesn't suffice. The student can't sufficiently explain, for example, the environment that they use, the software versions, the packages that they use, the algorithms that they develop. And the supervisor has no means of actually taking a look at what the student has done um, or use the student's project further. And there's no way to find a fix and uh, what used to be a promising project uh, is now doomed to fail due to miscommunication or a lack of sufficient collaborative um, means. Another problem is that you've had a postdoc uh, or a graduate student in your lab and they wrote a script and replied it successfully, published it um, on a specific data set. But a couple of months or years later, there's new data and that script used to work so well should also be used on that new data set. But we're using the script fails simply because everyone forgot how it worked. And it takes days or weeks to figure out how to adjust it to the new data or how to actually run it. And then the last thing is you work on a research, research question and a lab that you admire has just published a paper with a really interesting result. So you take that paper to a journal club, you analyze it, you find out everything that they did in the method section, and then you try to re-implement their analysis. But the results that you obtain from the data just look nowhere what the original authors reported, and there's also no way uh, for you to make it work. Now, the beautiful thing about these are not the beautiful thing, the astonishing thing about all of these problems is that they have all been reported about 30 years ago in a paper that is a really nice read that I can recommend. Um, and these problems, they are still common. Uh, there are labs and researchers that have figured out how to solve the, those problems for themselves, but uh, I would make the bold suggestion that these problems uh, in one or the other form are still so prevalent that they still in it, their entirety pose a threat to the reproducibility, to the efficiency of scientific work. And the solutions to them, they are in principle, they are not new. Uh, already 30 years ago, 
um, Buckheit and uh, the know -how had means to, to fix all of those. And 20 years ago, there were other people who had different means to fix those and 10 years ago. And today, um, there are amazing solutions that can, that can help with these problems and, and solve them. But as a field, there's still too much of a reproducibility crisis. There's still too much of not applying solutions for these problems. And obviously there are num numerous uh, solutions, uh, many, many more than I know. You'll know uh, lots of them, but we still need to shift the practices in our field to overcome uh, these common problems. And I hope that um, in this workshop, we'll introduce one or two other tools that you can add to your tool stack uh, in your daily endeavor to make science more efficient, more reproducible, um, more meaningful, and so forth. So um, what we're going to talk about here is um, Data Light, which is a tool that can help with small scale or large scale uh, data management. It's an academic software through a group of um, basically neuroscientists that um, develop it uh, mostly. It's open source um, and it is a tool that comes as a command line client uh, and uh, with a Python API. And what I want to do now is give you a quick rundown of the basics of DataLed and a little bit about its core features so that you have an idea of whether you want to stay in this workshop or not. So I've already said it, it is a command line tool and it's available for all major operating systems, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, where are my T license, so just open source software. You can contribute to us or to the project if you want to we would greatly appreciate any kind of um, contribution um, if you're interested. It is built on top of two version control tools, Git and Git Annex. And I've run a little pre-survey here in this group of people and most of you actually knew Git. So uh, I will talk about keywords or I will throw in some, some Git related keywords. But uh, if there's anything that uh, you actually don't know, then do uh, feel free to, to ask anything, even the most basic question, don't hesitate to to call me out for um, for just uh, trying to to not explain something properly. Um, but Git and Git Annex, for those who have not heard of either one of those tools, they are very popular and very powerful and also very, very established version control tools. And building up from these two tools, DataLed has um, three main features, as I like to summarize it. It is capable of version control and importantly, version controlling arbitrarily large content. We'll find out why that is a cool or impressive thing compared to Git. What this allows is that you can not only version control your code or your manuscripts that you write, but you can also version control your data or you can version control your software or everything together alongside of each other. The next large feature is transport mechanisms for sharing and obtaining data. And that makes data consumption as easy as it is to install software on a, for example, Debian based uh, or Linux based system, uh, where with a single line of code, you can basically install arbitrarily large data sets uh, for your disposal on your systems. What it also allows you is that you can extend the collaborative features of Git that you may have used in your previous work also to your data analysis, to your data acquisition, to your next experiment, uh, and so forth. And the last feature are computationally reproducible data analysis. And I won't be talking too much about them in this workshop, but what DataLet um, allows you to do is to track and also share provenance, that is information on how a digital object came to be and also how to um, recreate or redo this process automatically of any digital object that you may have uh, on your computer. And there are loads of more um, features. It's a very versatile software, um, but you'll see 
uh, that in passing throughout the workshop. And importantly, uh, DataLight is a tool that's completely domain agnostic. I'm a psychologist and the people that develop it um, come from neuroscience predominantly, but we have people working in geosciences, in physics, in linguistics, uh, and all throughout the bench. It's just completely domain agnostic. So don't be uh, discouraged from maybe from some examples you will see, especially tomorrow that use some neuroscientific stuff. You can also use that to version control your movie library, for example. Um, let me also highlight a couple, or let me also start with a few acknowledgements, credit where credit is due. Um, there are a lot of people that are involved in the creation and maintenance of the software. Um, and there are a lot of funders, scientific funders uh, in the US and in Germany that make sure that the developers are paid and that we are able to, to um, create and extend uh, the software. Uh, and we have a lot of international collaborators that I also want to mention here. Um, and because I'm using their illustrations really frequently uh, in my slides, I definitely want to shout out to the Turing Bay project in Scriberia for a really nice, uh, for some really nice uh, open science uh, illustrations um, and the Turing Bay handbook for um, scientific conduct, which I can also recommend to everyone who has not uh, seen that before. So just to give you a rundown of a couple of core concepts and features that we come back over the course of the workshop. Everything that we do happens in so-called data-led data sets. That is the core data structure and it's basically just a directory. You can create data sets from scratch and then they're empty, but you can also turn existing directories uh, into um, data led data sets so that you um, have a place where the contents uh, are managed. Data set is a git, git annex repository underneath the hood. So it's a versioned directory on your computer, but it essentially looks like a completely normal folder uh, on your file system. So here are two views, one from a file browser, one from the command line from the terminal and a data set just looks like a regular directory and also feels like it. Uh, importantly, whatever happens in your data set does not change your data uh, in any meaningful or destructive or transformative way. If you include a PDF into your data set and version control it, it will stay a PDF. There's no custom data structure involved. If data led would cease to exist from one day or the other, if you happen to uninstall it from your system on purpose or um, uh, without purpose, uh, without um, yeah, just uh, inadvertently, you will still be able to, to complete, to, to use those files. They will not depend on the presents of data led, it's everything, everything is safe. <laughs> um, in these data led data sets, you are able to version control arbitrarily large files. And if you are a user of version control tools, then you have the complete flexibility because we provide uh, something that we call a non-complex data led core API, which is intended to make version control easier, especially for those people who haven't used it before, because the Git workflow can be a little bit complex. But if you are an adapt Git or Git Annex user, then you're also completely free to use whichever Git or Git Annex commands uh, you are comfortable using with. They are completely interoperable. Data led just adds uh, functionality on top of these tools, but uh, it doesn't um, impede their functionality and it doesn't um, require you to only use data. Uh, data set uh, is version controlled and thus it has a very transparent history that you can use to find out what was done, um, interact uh, with the history to, for example, reset it to a previous state, how it used to be before, revert changes that you're not happy with or 
bring um, previously reverted changes back to life. You can find out what was done, when, how, and by whom. What you can see here is, for example, the collaborative um, work on a paper and, and um, a data analysis where I can transparently see which author has done what kind of change at what point in time. Um, you can identify precise versions, which is a really important feature, for example, when you're working with data, because data is also subject to change. Um, it is crucial to be able to tell for your data analysis on which data version or on which subset of uh, the data an analysis has been run, because if that data changes in the future, for example, because it is uh, extended with new files, because um, problems in the data are fixed because different pre-processing is applied, the results that you will obtain from your analysis change. So in order to have a um, thorough, uh, to have thorough transparency on what was actually done in your analysis, having versions and being able to precisely and machine readably identify those versions is crucial for, for reproducibility, for transparency, for your own, for your own saneness in working with any kind of data analysis. Um, data like data sets give you the ability. I have a lot of feedback. Um, was there a question? Okay, um, I don't think so, but if so, um, please just uh, say something. Um, Datasets give you the ability to consume and collaborate. You can um, install other datasets from other places, from other computers, from um, remote sources, from GitHub, all kinds of places. You'll see that in detail tomorrow. And you can also publish datasets to a lot of other places, um, such as cloud storage, um, repository hosting services, such as GitHub, GitLab. And then you're able to um, keep all of these data sets in sync. For example, by pulling updates from a different data set or by pushing the updates that you locally do in your data set to other places. This gives you the ability to sync backups. It also gives you the ability to collaborate with other people transparently across time zones and borders. Um, uh, and so forth. Um, I've already mentioned the provenance, what DataLed does, and that's in addition on top of Git and Git Annex, so you wouldn't be able to do that with Git and Git Annex commands, is that it can record whatever it was that has been done in a data set. And that includes record remote origin of files. For example, if you um, include a PDF into your data analysis that has all of the methods for your algorithm, then you can actually also include information where that file is retrieved from so that it can be retrieved automatically um, by people that you share your data set with or by yourself once you've forgotten where you actually retrieved that PDF from. You can also use commands that execute all kinds of, um, of any kind of command inside of your data set and then record the outcome of that in a way that makes it possible to repeat exactly what has been done by a machine. For example, when you run a script on some input data that produces some outputs, you can track this provenance in a way that makes it possible to repeat this analysis execution automatically. And then it also includes a check whether the outcome of the first, and, um, of the first uh, run and its repetition actually identical or whether something changed. Um, and then there's something that we call uh, nesting, um, which is a little bit counterintuitive on um, the first time you hear it. But what you can do with data-led data sets is you can nest them into each other, that is have a linked hierarchy of data sets. Um, we call that super data set and sub data set a super data set is a top level data set, a sub data set is any data set underneath. And these hierarchies of data sets can be arbitrarily deep. So you can have any amount of sub data sets in a individual data set or any amount of data sets, sub data sets uh, in this kind of row. 
Um, what that allows you to do is to have a mechanism in which you can create data set modules, just like, for example, software modules that you can flexibly reuse in any way you please, and that you can um, quite easily share and access control. So for example, we have one data set, which is the raw data that comes from your next EEG study. It contains anonymous data from patients. And that is a data led data set. And you keep it just locked up uh, on your hard, hard drive and no one else is allowed to see it because the data protection officer will kill you. Um, but then you do some pre-processing, which just strips all of the identifying information out of any of the files and uh, includes your favorite pre-processing pipeline. Uh, and in order to have a transparent track for yourself and your collaborators on what was done, you add this raw data set as a data dependency to your pre-processing data set. And what that results in is a version link to the precise version and identity of the raw data that was used to generate this pre-processed data. And once you have this kind of data module with pre-processed data, then you can distribute it to all of your graduate students. They each do their own analysis with it. So they reuse this uh, pre-processed data module really flexibly um, for their analysis. They each write the paper. And when you take a look at the paper, and you have appropriate permissions and everything is shared with you, then you can have this transparent track of everything that has been done in order to generate the results of this paper here. And you can trace it back through the analysis, through the pre-processing, back to the raw data uh, if, um, if shared with you. And if the raw data or the pre-processed data changes, if you have a different pipeline that's run, then uh, you actually can automatically, uh, for example, update all of the, these data dependencies, repeat the analysis, and have this really transparent pipeline with individual components um, as a hierarchy of data sets. And what you can also do is work with these hierarchies of data sets as if they are just a single data set. Uh, everything that we'll be talking about has a recursive option, uh, and that applies whatever operation it is, version control, provenance records, anything throughout any um, number of linked uh, subdata sets. So that you can, for example, update everything um, up to the raw data in this, in this uh, example. Uh, and then the last feature is third party integrations. What we try to do is to provide a tool that integrates as best as possible into workflows that you might already be using. So if you are using Google Drive to back up your data, or if you're using Figshare to publish your posters, or if you're using GitHub to publish your code, then all of those third party services uh, are already something that Datalet works with natively so that we have streamlined procedures that use whatever service or tool you already use uh, in the very same fashion. And if there's something that is missing, then just you know, make a feature request and then we might be able um, to, to implement that. And to just give you some real world examples of what Datalet can be used for in really large use cases to, to give you an idea. Um, one thing that we use it for is as a behind the scenes infrastructure component. And that's, uh, for example, used in the Canadian Open Neuroscience platform, but also stuff like an Open Neuro. So if you know Open Neuro, it's this portal here where you can publish and uh, also retrieve um, terabytes of uh, Open Neuroscientific datasets. And for every dataset that's on Open Neuro, you actually also have the possibility to get a download link for Datalet with which you can uh, clone this data set because Open Neuro in the background as a data management tool uses Datalet and every single data set is a Datalet data set. And if you go to brainlife.io, which is a cloud computing platform where you can in ingest all kinds of data sets directly from Open Neuro, uh, this is also uh, internally fueled by Datalet uh, with uh, data provision. A different use case more on the personal side, um, individual researcher side, is for creating and sharing reproducible open science. So here's, for example, a paper 
of mine, which includes code, data, and manuscript for a paper that I've written. And this is a publicly accessible GitHub repository, which makes scientific outputs accessible to plenty of people without requiring a user account. And um, there's stuff on it about this on the internet, also tutorials. It's actually a like automatically reproducible paper, but importantly, it links code, it links data, it links software uh, of this research uh, that I've done and shares it. And here's another really great example that I very much like from a colleague from Berlin who has created a really nice study and then published this um, book, this R Markdown book, where he includes all of the data. It's, I think it's one and a half terabytes that are publicly hosted. Um, you'll get to know how to do this tomorrow, uh, including the code so that everything can be rerun on demand and expected by uh, colleagues and the scientific public. Um, we in our institute, uh, which is a quite a large institute, use it for central data management. Um, we are a neuroscientific institute and we use a lot of open data sets, um, also stuff that's uh, access restricted like the UK Biobank data set. And we provide all of this data internally uh, as a large super data set, which anyone who uh, has access um, by, for example, signing the DUI, DUA, uh, can retrieve any data that they need onto our cluster in a streamlined fashion and that saves us disk space and also coordinates, let's say, standardization and pre-processing efforts. Um, and then it, we've just very recently created a computing framework based on data led for reproducible science, but importantly also for, for scalable science. It has been published just last month uh, where we used a framework that's based on data led to create research that you can automatically reproduce on your laptop for data sets that are too large to fit on any given compute infrastructure. So what we did with this framework is not only create these reproducible provenance track stuff, but we importantly also uh, ran a really large scale analysis on hardware that was uh, essentially not large enough to fit the raw data that was used onto it. Um, so if that's something that interests you, then we can also talk a little bit about this. And that was the quick rundown.